Open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. We have been um, going through our series called Shaken. I mentioned that a minute ago. And if you are a guest to Grace Baptist Church, our normal, our normal practice is to go through books of the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept. We believe in expository preaching. That's where we open up the Word of God and uh, tell you what it says by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And that is the basis for everything that we do here. Um, Teaching is communicating information. Preaching is boldly proclaiming the Word of God and demanding a response. That's the difference between preaching and teaching. Both are vitally important. Preachers are supposed to teach. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the role of the pastor is identified as pastor-teacher. Teaching is vitally important. And um, we're going to be looking at this area of modern education, and we're calling it the counsel of the ungodly. And you'll see why here in a minute. But let's read our text and pray, and we'll dive in. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Heavenly Father, please help us to know Your Word. Father, help us to hear Your Word today and apply it across the board to every area of our lives. Lord, I pray for the hearer, that You will help them to hear every word. And Father, I pray that You'll help me to only say those things that You would have me today, and that You'll be honored and glorified as we lift You up through Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, let me, this is a, a little disclaimer at the beginning. Um, it, we're going to be dealing with a lot of different information today. I'm going to try and define every term, it, but if I do deal with subjects that you don't, you're not familiar with, um, that's all right. There'll be stuff here for you also. We have educators here, and so I'm going to be using some terminology that would be more familiar for them. But if I stop and define everything, we'll be here all day, okay? So please give me a little leeway on that. Normally I try not to do that, but today we're going to. I want us to talk about modern education. And uh, what, here's the idea. We're going to look at what, what um, educators, the designers of our educational system have said. Then we're going to look at what the Bible says. And then we're going to look at where we are today and what to do. That's the format that we're going to follow. Now let me say this, before again, before we, we dive in. And I want you to understand the difference between when I'm talking about the designers of our educational system and our teachers. How many teachers do we have here today? All right. We're not talking about the teachers. Now, are there individual teachers that that would agree with this philosophy? Yes. But I'm not talking about the teachers. I'm talking about the designers of the system. And then we'll talk about our teachers here in a little little while. Um, So if you're a teacher here today, give me a hearing and uh, and we'll, we'll do well. All right, modern education, the counsel of the ungodly. Why are we calling it the counsel of the ungodly? Well, look at Psalms chapter 1, the first Psalm, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now, now that's the blessed man. He's not going to do those things, but here's what he's going to do. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Anybody here want your kids to prosper? All right. Verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but like the chaff, but are like the chaff, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So there are two ways that are described here. There's the way of godliness and there's the way of the ungodly. There's the blessed man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law doth he meditate day and night. So you have the counsel of the godly and you have the counsel of the ungodly. The counsel of the godly would be meditating on God's word and in his law and basing everything on that. That would be the counsel of the godly. How many of you would agree with that? Amen. 
Now let's look at what the founders, the people who are the recognized founders of modern education, let's see what they had to say and see if I'm right in calling it the Council of the Ungodly. Modern education. Now this definition, this is the definition that was given in 1828 by Noah Webster. Anyone here ever heard of Noah Webster? I went to Webster Hill Elementary School in fourth grade. Noah Webster's house was on the grounds of the school. And so the, and I was just able to go there about three weeks ago again and see it. But modern education, here's, here is his definition of education. The bringing up as of a child, instruction, formation of manners, I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. Anyone been to school lately? Formation of manners. Education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline, which is intended to enlighten the understanding, correct the temper, and form the manners and habits of youth, and fit them for usefulness in their future stations. The manners and habits of youth. Correct the temper. Enlighten the understanding. He goes on. To give children a good education in manners, arts, and science is important. To give them a religious education is indispensable. And an immense responsibility rests on parents and guardians who neglect these duties. That's Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary. How many of you here would agree with that definition of education? Amen? Amen? That is the definition of education that we as believers would hold to. I have here, this is called Wayland's Moral Science. This was published in, this particular book was published in 1837. It was written in 1835. This book was the property of Urbana University. All right? They don't have any use for it anymore. Listen to what he said. Uh, Let me say this. Let me read to you the purpose of this book. It's called Elements of Moral Science. This is the preface or preface for Shane Thomas. (laughs) Sorry, buddy. In the following work, I have attempted to present the more important truths of moral science in such a form as may be useful in schools and academies. So this was written, and this was the ethics handbook for all the kids who went to public schools. This is the one that was used. Francis Wayland also wrote the first book on economics that was ever used in the United States of America, Francis Wayland. He was a Baptist preacher, president of Brown University in Rhode Island. Oh, he is also the father of the elective system and the university system. I mean, he has a profound influence on education, Francis Wayland. So this is what education used to be. This is chapter 8, and this is the duties and rights of children. This is taught in the ethics handbook for the public school children. The duties of children may be comprised under the following particulars. Now, first of all, I want you to notice how far we have progressed in education, that this was for children. All right? Obedience. By this I mean that the child is under obligation to conform to the will of the parent because it is his will. Aside from the consideration that what is required may seem to the child wisest or best. The only limitation here is that of conscience. A child must obey God rather than his parent. Even here, however, he has no right to resist. He must obey God and suffer meekly the consequences. How does that fit with modern philosophy? Listen to what he says here. Children are bound to reverence or as scriptures express it, to honor their parents. By reverence, I mean that conduct and those feelings which are due from an inferior to a superior. The child is bound to show respect and honor to his parents, such as he would show to no other persons. In other words, your parents are more important in your upbringing than anyone. That's what he's teaching them. You're going to give them respect that you would give to no other person. Listen to what he says. This is a little bit, oh, he talks about this. Filial affection, or the affection due from a child to its parents, because they are his parents. Now, he could talk about filial uh, affection, 
because one of the keys to education in these days was languages and the classical languages. Children were taught Greek, Hebrew, and Latin, and especially Greek and Latin. Every child who went to school was taught Greek and Latin. How many of you were taught Greek and Latin in school? See, it's all changed, man. It's all changed. I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. But listen to what he says. He's talking about filial affection. Then he goes on. It is the duty of the child whenever it is by the providence of God rendered necessary to support its parents in old age. That man is guilty of monstrous ingratitude who would not cheerfully deny himself of luxuries or conveniences in order to minister to the wants of his aged and needy parents. You know, he doesn't mention Social Security anywhere in here. You see how our thinking has changed? See, here's the idea. It's not Dan New's responsibility to support my parents. It's my responsibility to help my parents. That's what he was teaching in 1837. Our country understood that. Why has it all changed? Why has even our understanding of right and wrong? And then he goes on to give about three pages of Scripture references for children obeying their parents. Public school, okay? Now, this was Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary definition of education. So you see how Francis Whalen and Noah Webster, Noah Webster, a Presbyterian, Francis Whalen, a Baptist, but they understood, they, but they agreed on the education of children. Do you, do you all agree with that? Do you see that? What happened? How did it change? John Dewey is identified as the father of progressive education. If you look up any, I have the Encyclopedia of World Biography in my study. It's, I don't know, 20 volumes of biographies. And it identifies John Dewey as the father of modern education or the father of progressive education. He and Horace Mann are the fathers of modern education. That's how they're identified in every book. All right? So this is not the Baptist preacher's opinion. This is the opinion of all educated people. All right? Now, as opposed to Baptist preachers. Now... Listen to what he said. I believe that education is the fundamental method of social progress and, and, and reform. Social progress and reform. Now, what's interesting about that statement, he wrote this in about 1890, 1893. Let me tell you where he came up with his ideas. He, he, he was not a religious person. He, he didn't understand religion. He didn't necessarily like it as he was growing up. I think he grew up in Vermont. Um, but as he was growing up, he went to college. When he went to college, he read the writings of T.H. Huxley, Thomas Huxley. Thomas Huxley is popularly known as Darwin's bulldog. All right, He's the guy that took Darwin's ideas and forced them in, onto the public consciousness. Herbert Spencer was the philosopher behind Darwinism, and it was through... Herbert Spencer, that it reached into religion and economics and all other areas, uh, but the, it, it, that came from Darwinism, all right? So what happens is Dewey reads Huxley, and that gave him his foundation for all of his understanding. He became what is known as a naturalist, that only those things that are not supernatural are real, okay? So that, that became his, his philosophy. Then he was influenced by the socialists. Now, when he's talking about social progress and reform, when we hear that, we think of the progress of society. But we need to understand that when people talk about social progress, they're talking about communism. That's what it means. All right? So he was a socialist, and he wanted to impose socialism on the educational system in America. So he's saying this, I believe that education is the fundamental method of social progress and reform. I believe that it is the business of everyone interested in education to insist upon the school as the primary and most effective instrument of social progress and reform. That's what he wrote in his book, Education Today. All right, so he wanted to use the school for social progress. Well, remember what Webster said about education. It has nothing to do with social progress. It had to do with educating the child. School's not for society, school's for the, for the child. We're, we're, I want you to hold on to that thought. Now, let's go on. He said this, I believe that in this way the teacher is the prophet of the true God and the usherer in of the true kingdom of God. We certainly cannot teach religion as an abstract essence. 
we have got to teach something as religion, and that means practically some religion. Our schools are performing an infinitely significant religious work. What religion is he talking about? It is their business to do what they can to prevent all public educational agencies from being employed in ways which inevitably impede the recognition of the spiritual import of science and of democracy. Spiritual import of science and democracy. And hence of that type of religion, which will be the flower of the modern spirit's achievement. What religion is he talking about? We make a religion of our education. We profess unbounded faith in its possibilities. We point with pride to its advance. We term instruction and art and school management a profession. Now, that school management, that was a new concept. School management. This goes back, there was a man named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He wrote a famous book called Emile, and in this book he talked about the social contract. How many of you have heard of the social contract? of Rousseau. The concept of Rousseau's social contract, this gave us the idea of socialism apart from God, a great worldwide society that would come together. This was an enlightenment idea of elevating humanity apart from God because religion was a negative influence on the world. That's that's the concept, okay? This idea, we came from that from that idea came the idea of total quality management. Other ideas that came from that. Let me give you an example. This is uh, 1943. William Pearson Tolley was the chancellor of Syracuse University, 1943. He said, in a slave state, vocational training may be education enough. For the education of free men, much more is required. How many of you agree with that? I agree with that statement, 100%. All right? Total quality management. How many of you have heard of total quality management? W. Edward Deming went to Japan following World War II. Now, you remember that MacArthur was responsible for rebuilding, and Deming built the management system that allowed the Japanese uh, manufacturing system to basically conquer the world. Right? You understand that. Now, let me give you a little background for myself that when I became familiar with this or aware of it, I remember as a boy, I I had to be in high school or younger uh, when um, Donahue, the the Phil Donahue show was on. I remember the Phil Donahue show. Now, I don't know that we knew how radical Phil Donahue was. We know that now. But he's a communist, right? You understand he's a communist. that's, That's not just a preacher because that's what he would tell you. He's a communist. Well, he would have Deming on to talk about his ideas. And that always struck me, even as a boy, that struck me as unusual because with, with Phil Donahue being a socialist, why is he talking about, to this guy who was so big into business and helping businesses? Because total quality management is the idea of an elite group of managers controlling through psychological manipulation the worker bees. That's what it's about. Team building. Anyone heard of anything about team building in, at, work, at the workplace? That's total quality management. The idea is if you're not a part of the team, you're an outsider. If you're an individual, you've got to go because the greater social good is more important. We've got to teach loyalty to the organization above all else. Has anyone ever heard any of this stuff? That all comes from Deming. That goes all the way back to Rousseau and this concept of socialism. Well, now this total quality management has come into our schools. Do we have any team building at schools? Do we have teams of teachers teaching rather than one person being responsible for people? Do we have any of that going on in our schools? All of this concept, it all goes together. Okay? Now, before you think I'm crazy, let's just go on. We're going to keep building it. I probably am crazy, but some of the stuff is true. (laughs) All right? So he's talking about we term instruction and uh, and art and school management a profession. 
Faith in education signifies nothing less than belief in the possibility of deliberate direction of the formation of human disposition and intelligence. So we are going to form the disposition. You know how teachers, here, here's how you know that now. When you assess values and attitudes, that's what the testing is to determine now. Values and attitudes. What in the world does that have to do with education? Let me ask you a question. How many of you have, have had your children take assessments or given assessments? Do you know what the word assess means? What does the word assess mean? It's to determine a value for tax purposes. That's what an assessment is. How many of you recognize that term now? Have you ever had your property assessed? And you love to see them come. You know, we, we added something onto our house. A guy knocks on the door. Hello, I'm the assessor. How about you get off my property? <laughs> Why? Because they want to take more money of me. Uh, so now you have, you know, from to total quality management, we went from individuals to human resources to now you're identified as human capital. Children are identified in all the literature now as human capital. Human capital. And so we assess their value. And they're given a point system. This child's value is a certain number. That value determines their marketability in the workplace. That's where we are. Do you remember the whole foundation of our nation where the rights and the value of the individual? Now it's the right of the collective, and the value of the person is determined on their cooperation within the collective, within the Borg. <laughs> that was for Nathaniel Tennant. Just bring him back to where we are. All right? Now, honestly, that Star Trek stuff, do you know that he was into this? This was the kind of stuff that was the foundation for what he was writing. Isaac Asimov, all of those guys, they were into this stuff. It's the basis for it. Okay? Now, Ray Bradbury, whatever. Now, faith in education signifies nothing less than belief in the possibility of the deliberate direction and the formation of human disposition and intelligence. If we have ground to be religious about anything, we may take education religiously. So you understand that your children are not going to school, they're going to temple. That's their religion. And I know that your religion... In many cases, I want to be nice. I don't want to be ugly. We have to be careful that we don't succumb to this idea. Do you realize we had our Bible conference recently, and there were people who didn't come to Bible conference because it was going a little late and their kids had to be up for school the next day. There are people that are away this weekend because they can't go away during the week because the kids have school. It's okay to miss church, but let's not miss school. Because the school is the temple. We have the religion of education. And we bow before the altar of the diploma. Now, let's go on. Let me say something else. My manner of speech... For modern culture, it's over the top. It's very judgmental. It, it's, it's, it's not tolerant at all. Amen? I, I mentioned in my Sunday school class that I, I preached a message several years ago. My brother listened to it, and it was during the, the election when Al Gore was running. And he called me up, and he said, you're crazy. <laughs> he said, you can't say that stuff in public. We have gotten to the place. You ought to read the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Read them. You want to hear wild speech. You ought to hear what Thomas Jefferson said to John Adams. He called him hermaphroditus. It, the, the way that people speak and are understood, it's completely changed. So we have to understand that clear speech is easily understood. Amen? It's easily understood. And I am passionate about this, and we need to think clearly about it. Here, again, here's Charles Francis Potter. Charles Francis Potter wrote in the 1930s. 
He was also, along with John Dewey, one of, the, one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto. I believe Potter was the author of the Humanist Manifesto. Don't quote me on that, though. I, I'm, that's just floating somewhere in there. And he said that humanism is a new type of religion altogether. Is humanism a religion? It is both a religion and a philosophy of culture. That's, this is from Humanism, a New Religion by Charles Francis Potter. Charles Francis Potter was a Baptist preacher who became a Unitarian pastor. And as a Unitar- Unitarian, became a humanist. All right? When you begin rejecting the authority of God's Word, anything's possible, folks. I'm a Baptist. Well, so was he. All right, now, let's look at this. Are you ready for this? If this doesn't shake you up, the next slide, this is from Potter. Education is the most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday schools, meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? That was 1930. See, we have this idea that it's gotten better. We have this idea that this didn't impact me. This is only new. This is, the 90s is where this is happening. They were schools of humanism in the 1930s. Anyone heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial? Scopes Monkey Trial? How many of you have heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial? Inherit the wind. Remember, you had William Jennings Bryan. He goes down to represent the the, the city of Dayton, Tennessee, against Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow is defending this guy Scopes. And what they did, the evolutionists found a teacher who was willing to fight against the laws against teaching evolution. Okay, there was a law in Dayton, Tennessee that was against the law to teach evolution. He decided to teach evolution, and so he was arrested for doing that. Clarence Darrow came and defended him, and uh, William Jennings Bryan fought against him in the court battle. Now, Inherit the Wind with Spencer Tracy made a buffoon out of William Jennings Bryan. What you need to understand is William Jennings Bryan won the case. Because it was against the law to teach evolution. The reason that Spencer Tracy made him look like a buffoon is Spencer Tracy was an ACLU liberal socialist, you know, guy that would hate you and me. They hate who we are. And that was all the way back then. The school system was taken over by these people in the teens, 20s, and 30s. It's not new. All right, let's go on. I hope that this, I hope that you see what they're saying here. Look at what Isaiah 5.20 says. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So you have a school system that in every class, in every curriculum, you get globalism. It's the idea of a one world government. When God divided the nations for a reason. You have multiculturalism. Multiculturalism and diversity is the idea that all cultures are valuable and equally important. That's ridiculous. If multiculturalism is true, then why are people dying to get into America? Apparently, they have deemed our system better than theirs. Uh, Ravi Zacharias said it this way, In one culture they say, love your neighbor. In another culture they say, eat your neighbor. Which do you prefer? In every class, there's this concept of multiculturalism and diversity. I was speaking with Nathaniel. He teaches social studies. And it is his job, sixth grade? In sixth grade. His curriculum runs from early, the the early civilizations, all the way through the founding of our country. And in the book, they're given basically equal time. They're not equal. They're not equal. And you have a moral relativism in the curriculum that makes no judgments on those cultures. We we just this week 
saw this woman who's the spokesperson for the White House speaking at a high school saying that her greatest advisor, the, per, the philosopher that she, two philosophers that she loves more than any other, Mother Teresa and Mao Tse Tung. You got to understand, Mao killed 70 million people. But his little red book, people love it. We see kids wearing um, Che Guevara shirts. The art for President Obama was, a, was the Che image with Obama on it. Because Che Guevara is the hero of the revolutionary, the hero of the socialist. Well, he said he liked nothing better than shooting people in the head. He liked to come up behind them and shoot them in the head. He, had, he personally killed 2,000 people in his prison under Castro. That's what he did. He enjoyed it. He loved it. I've been to his birthplace, Rosario, Argentina. They have a big statue to him. They love him. He's a hero to them. He's a cold-blooded killer. But our school literature does not identify it that way. These people, there's, there's a moral equivalency. I'm sorry. George Washington is a hero. Che Guevara is an animal and a killer. What's wrong with us? Can I ask you a question? What does it take to make you mad? What is it going to take? In speaking with young people, I ask some of our teachers this. What do your students, what causes outrage in your students? Nothing. They're a dial tone. Nothing. Why? Because they have had relativism, the equality of everything, jammed down their throats. We have got to stop, folks, and understand what's going on in our culture. And we as Christians are the same way. When you have a president espousing radical communist ideas, and we're sitting there, oh, I guess I should have voted for somebody else. We don't have any idea what's going on. Why? Can, can I listen to what I'm going to say here? This is the common answer from the teachers. We have a bunch of kids that can't read. Well, the parents don't help us. How many of you have ever heard that statement? Yeah, the parents are a result of the same system the kids are. It's intentional. It's intentional. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. How many of you understand we have a problem with literacy in America? Seriously, how many of you understand that we have that problem? I just looked at, this morning, the National Association of Educational Progress. This is the, the national organization that does all of the testing. And so it all goes into this data bank. So we know what's going on. Total quality management. That's where this concept comes from. But anyway, uh, this is for 2009, based on last year. Fourth to eighth graders, 30% demonstrate proficiency at grade level in math. 30%. How are we doing? How are we doing? So let's go back to the reading. Here's the idea. Listen to what I'm going to say. It's the, it's the parents' fault. We're not getting support from the parents, and that's why the kids can't read. You have them for eight hours. How long does it take to learn to read? We've got to start thinking about stuff. Here's the idea. If I'm teaching a kid and he doesn't know how to read, we have a group of kids and their reading isn't where it's supposed to be. No, I'm sorry. You're not going to the next class. You've got to stay here and learn to read today. Oh, wait a minute, the administration wouldn't like that. That means the system is designed to keep kids from learning. Why? Because we have all of the non-academic standards that have to be met. Socialization. What is the number one argument of even Christians who are school teachers against homeschooling? Socialization. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, communism. Kids learn to talk from their parents. They learn to interact with people in, in society. You don't have to go to school to learn that. Do you see how we've been brainwashed? We have been lied to. You walk into a school, you see the kid in the back row who's beaten up because his, his complexion isn't right. He, because he's not the smartest tool in the shed. They're tormented. How are their socialization skills? Can I ask you a question? How many of you were picked on at school? Seriously. My hand's up too. 
oh, that really helped my socialization. It turned me into this. <laughs> An angry white man. <laughs> Do you see how crazy we are? Seriously. Do you see how crazy we are? I mean, we have gone over, and we're Christians. We're Bible-believing Christians. And we spout the lies of the enemy over and over again. Proverbs 1.10, My son of sinners enticed thee, consent thou not. I refuse to consent to that kind of pablum. I refuse. I refuse. Because our thinking must be gauged by the Word of God. Now let me say this, man. I know you teachers... You work so hard. You love those kids. You love the Lord. You care about it. But you, as much as anyone, need to be aware of the system. And every day that you walk into that school, you need to go in believing that you are going to war. Why? I have this. I have a copy of this. For all of our our teachers that are here today, and I may have enough for some parents also, this is called All Children Left Behind, How Federal Education Reform Dramatically Alters the Purpose and Content of Preschool to Higher Education and Beyond. Why is it that school days have to get longer and school years have to get longer? Well, we don't have enough time because kids aren't meeting their standards. Okay, they're longer than they've ever been, and kids are doing math at 30%. Why is this happening? Because of socialization, we're trying to assimilate the children for the societal good. Now, we've got to understand the whole concept of work, of school to work. That, that's, the, that's the principle that's being taught now. JVS, kids leave school junior, high, or junior year and senior year, go to JVS to learn a skill. Why? Because their testing has determined that that's going to be the best thing for them. Well, I had tests that I was lousy at. You know, they probably would have had me, you know, changing gaskets somewhere. Don't miss this. The object of education is to teach... Now, here's liberty. This is the, this is the concept of liberty. is to teach a child, equip him to be whatever God wants him to be. How many of you agree that's what education is? Modern education is to equip a child for the workplace. Might not need to do math there. Individualism is to be spurned. When you look at the national standards, go, go to the website. It's, uh, go to N-A-E-P. Just check it out. National standards are how do they work in a group? How do you think Einstein worked in a group? How do you think Edison worked in a group? How do you think I worked in a group? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Has there ever been a leader in history that worked well in a group? No, that's why people follow them. How many of you want your kids to be leaders? How many of you want to make sure they get a good job at the factory? Praise God for factories. How many of you are thankful for those factory jobs? Amen. How many of you hope your child never walks into one? Seriously. Everybody that works in one. How many of you want your daughter to walk into one? These ladies working at these factories, by the time they're 50, their bodies are falling apart. They're not built for that. Oh, that's a sexist statement. Okay? Write this down. My name's Jim Alter, and I'm a sexist. <laughs> Look. Look. God built us for different things. I'm not very good at having babies. <laughs> Laura was gone for the week. She was out in Colorado abandoning her family. <laughs> Kids, how do I do? <laughs> Laura makes Lydia this Cholito thing, you know? And so I was going to do that for her. And so she has the tortilla out there, and I take the chili that Laura had made out, and I put it on the chilito, and she said, shouldn't you heat it up first? <laughs> Just eat it! <laughs> She's the keeper at home. She's way better at that than I am. God created her to do that, 
to be the keeper at home. You know that's what the Bible says. Let me say that again. You know that's what the Bible says. Why do we need longer school days? Because the wife has to go to work. So now we have people who do not know God caring for our children from toddler through the end of college. And we wonder why 80%, listen, 80% of the children who grow up in Bible-believing churches who go to the public school leave the faith within two years of high school. Now, let me say that again. I don't want you to miss it. 80% of children who grow up in Bible-believing churches, not liberal churches, Bible-believing churches, 80% of the children who grow up in Bible-believing churches who go to the public school leave the faith within two years of graduation. Why? Because they've been at the Temple of Humanism five days a week for 12 years. And they come to church maybe an hour or two a week, as long as there's not a soccer game, as long as there's not a football game, as long as we don't need to go camping. Don't miss school, though. It's getting real quiet in here. It's getting real quiet in here. We have lost our minds. We have absolutely lost our minds. I need a babysitter. Can you find me an atheist? I want to find an, how about a homosexual? I, need, I want to find a homosexual to take care of my child for a little while. It's okay. It's just an alternate lifestyle. Pastor, you are so hateful. Listen. How many of you are going to call up the local homosexual to have them babysit your kids? Anybody? But they're allowed to teach in the public school system. You know that we have them here in Sydney. And if a teacher stands up and says, look, I don't want my child being taught by a homosexual, how's that going to go at the school? I'll take an ad out in the paper. I don't want sodomites teaching my kids. It's wicked. It's filthy. They get diseases and die. How many of you know that's true? Seriously, how many of you know that's true? The average life expectancy of a homosexual man in the United States of America is 40 years, apart from AIDS. But it's a healthy alternative lifestyle. They are lying to us. And how many of you, seriously, how many of you are a little shocked that I just said that about the sodomites? That kinda, I mean, not that I would say it, but that somebody would say it publicly. <laughs> We're in a soft culture, man. There are churches, the, the uh, American Baptist Association has a homosexual chapter. Our culture is nuts, man. It is nuts. We must get back to knowing what the Bible says about education. We've got to do it. Look at, uh, at um, let's look at some verses. We're going to continue this this evening. I'm going to show you from Colossians chapter 2 this evening that the Bible identifies. Well, let's just look at it, and then we'll break it down tonight. But look at Colossians chapter 2. Remember, the Bible's supposed to be our authority for everything. Now, look, if you're a guest and you're thinking that I'm the most politically incorrect, rude person you've ever met, um, that's probably true. <laughs> this is why I'm not running for anything. But listen, all, all of my attitudes that I have just expressed can be found expressly stated in the Word of God. Clearly stated in the Word of God. The language of Jesus Christ was much harsher than mine. He called these religious leaders dogs. He called them snakes. He called them whited sepulchers, your graves full of dead men's bones. You stink. That's what Jesus said to them. See, we, we don't understand Jesus. We have this, this weird, uh, effeminate, emasculated concept of our Savior. That, that's the Savior that made a whip and drove the people out of the temple. You know, look at uh, Colossians chapter 2. And I want you to see something. We, the, the, the concept of our modern education system is humanistic, and that is that we can only teach things that have naturalistic causes. So we're not allowed to talk about God. We can refer to God on an equal basis with all the other gods in the world, but we can't talk about, it being, about God being the one true God, right? That's the basis of our educational system in America. Listen to what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, and look at verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, 
being knit together in love and unto all riches. Now look at what this says. The riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Jesus Christ. So you're acknowledging the mystery. Now what is a mystery? In the Bible, a mystery is something that could not be known unless God told you what it was. All right? So now we're learning about God and the Son and the Spirit. Now look at what it says in verse 3. In whom are hid some... What does all mean? Okay. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So now, when you go to one of these temples called a school that rejects the Lordship of Jesus Christ, rejects the transcendence of the one true God, and they do, not the individual teachers, but the system, right? And you're sending your children there to get knowledge. There's only one problem. There isn't any. I know you're thinking, wait a minute. That's where I went to school. And that's why I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, socialized into the worker bee system. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we need to renew our minds. Why? Because we have been conformed to the world through a system that is anti-Christ. True knowledge isn't there. Now, look at verse 8. This is how they do it. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Do you get any of that at school? How about vain deceit? Children? This happened billions of years ago. How many of you kids were ever taught in school that something happened billions of years ago? Is that vain deceit? Empty lies? Is it? Vain deceit, philosophy, vain deceit after the tradition of men. We've got to learn the tradition of men because if we learn the traditions of God, that's religion. We can't have that. Then look at what it says, after the rudiments of the world. That's the foundational principles of this world. One of the goals, and it's listed here, one of the goals of the teaching, of the testing apparatus in our schools today is to teach children to be worldly. That's what it says. We want them to be worldly. How many of you, the desire for you is that your children be worldly? That is the stated, the stated objective of the National Association of Educational Progress. That's what the purpose of the tests are. You can go on the website. You can go on the website. Now, first of all, you can't go and see the test that your children are taking. Teachers, are you allowed to show the parents the test that the children are taking for the national standards? Are you allowed to do that? No. They're not allowed to see it. I'm just telling you, I dare you to try to give something to my kids that I don't know about. What's worth dying for? What's worth fighting for other than your children? Do you understand that when your children are brainwashed into that system, they, may, they and your, their children may go to a Christless hell for all eternity? How many of you believe in hell? Anyone here believe in hell? then maybe it matters what you teach your kids. Maybe it matters the philosophy that is there. National standards. The federally funded McRell has a compendium of education standards for behavioral studies and life work aligned with the scans, scantrons, scans that all the kids take. Worth noting is the dubious demonstrates loyalty to the organization. A 9th through 12th grade life work benchmark for standard 7 displays reliability and a basic work ethic, consider the transformable, the transferable group mentality, demonstrate loyalty, um, all, all that. This is, what's, this is what's required. Now, here's the problem for our teachers. 
this is the mastery learning. You know that you get a grade, they have a mastery of the subject now, the mastery learning. This Again, this is a part of the total quality management in education. This is, um, this is from the Tangled Web Mastery Learning, OBE, STW, that's School to Work, Total Quality Management Connection. This is from Joe Esposito, 1996-1997. This is from the 1993 National Governors Association Conference in Minneapolis from Cynthia Weatherly. In April of 1993, I attended the National Governors Association Conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The theme of the conference was total quality management and education. At the first day's session, designed for administrators and elected officials, a representative of IBM was the facilitator. Now remember, teachers are no longer teachers, they're facilitators. They facilitate... Uh, assimilation into the board. Facilitator. During her explanation of how to restore, restructure your schools with total quality management principles, a school superintendent asked what could be done about teachers who were not willing to make the adjustment to the restructuring process. First, she explained how expensive it is to retrain teachers through staff development who have been on the job for years rather than hire new graduates who are already trained. Then, using a total quality management flow chart, she pointed to the box on the chart marked waste management. She said, you watch them closely, document their mistakes, and get rid of them. So you don't get rid of a teacher for not teaching well. You don't get rid of a teacher for anything other than not going along with the assimilation process. That's where we are, folks. And I'm just telling you, it is time for some outrage. Now, we're homeschooling now. I'm thankful for the Christian school. We have several of the people from the Christian school here, and they're, they are, they're tremendous educators. But when my kids were at the Christian school, I would go to the Christian school when I had a problem with what was going on. Right? I'd talk to the teachers. We would do that. But that's called parenting. How many times have you been to the public school to talk to your teachers, to your kids' teachers, about what's going on in the curriculum? Here's one of the responses that I get from people. Hey, I was in it and it didn't hurt me. Well, evidently it did. Because you don't care. There's no moral outrage about the environmentalism, relativism, moral equivalency, diversity, multiculturalism, globalism, and anti-God curriculum that is being taught to your children. I'm just telling you, the Sydney school system ought to fear every Christian in this community. They ought to fear us. They should fear us because we're going to be watching what's taught. We're going to be listening. We're reading curriculum. We know what's going on. And we're, you got to get this. All teaching is indoctrination. That's what teaching is. Doctrine means teaching. Indoctrination means getting that teaching in them. All teaching is indoctrination. You're either being indoctrinated in the Word of God and in godly principles, or you're being indoctrinated into humanism. And we wonder why our kids walk away from the Lord. Now look, I understand that some of my speech could probably be deemed as over the top. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. We have just become so desensitized to the relativism and the atheism that's being imposed on us. Now, I warn the, the, the Christian school people. Man, the national standards they're trying to impose on you is to bring, the, bring, bring about the same result. They don't care what school the kids go to other than the money for the child. Remember, one of the big reasons they don't like homeschooling is because the school system loses the money when your children come out of the school. Why? Human capital. Human capital. Human capital. My kids are more important to me than the school system. You school teachers who are Christians, don't defend the system. If you're defending the system, you're defending Antichrist. The purpose of it is to remember what the purpose of public education is. You might want to write this down. The purpose of public education is to teach your children how to succeed apart from God. And what we've done is we take the principles from the Word of God and we know them. I've got a whole list of them that we could go through, and most of us would know them. But somehow we think that's the role of the church, and then it's the role of the school to educate. 
Well, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but there's no fear of the Lord among the, the, the people that set the curriculum for the schools, well, then what are they getting? Amen? Are, is anybody following me today? Is anybody tracking with me? Is there anybody that can say amen to what's been preached here today? Amen. amen. If you're a guest, man, we're not always this crazy. But I want you to know that it's time for a group of Americans to get up in arms. Why, why was the, the Boston Tea Party? Why did it happen? Because they added a penny tax. You know, we're getting ready to have a you know, trillion-dollar Medicare, uh, 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 health care system. Oh, well, you know, it's just politics. There's no outrage. Bill Bennett wrote a book called The Death of Outrage. It's gone. What do we get worked up about? Somebody calling a homosexual a sodomite? That's what we get worked up about. We, we, we've lost our minds, folks. Can we just become biblical? Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Word of God and we're going to look at what the Bible says about education. What the Bible says about education. How, how many of you would agree with what John Dewey said about education? How about Francis Potter? You give, give him to us for five days a week, and an hour of Sunday school won't change him. That's where we are. That's where we are. And that's why your children sit in church like this. Can't talk to them. Can't talk to them. We've got to do something about it, folks. We've got to do something. Does that mean that you need to take your children out of the public school system? That's between you and God. Does that mean you need to send them to the Christian school? That's between you and God. Do I need to take them out of the Christian school? That's between you and God. I'm just saying it's no one's responsibility to train your children but you. And you're supposed to be involved in that every step of the way. You can't just drop them off and hope it all turns out well. Amen? When Jesus said, if, if someone offend one of these little ones, it would be better for a millstone to be tied about their neck and for them to be cast into the sea. Was that hyperbole? See, our moral outrage has been defined by the culture. The idea of fighting and dying for the heart and minds of our children, that sounds so extreme now. Doesn't it? Seriously. Were Jesus' words extreme? Oh, yeah. Did Jesus ever say anything that wasn't absolutely true and absolutely important for us? Man cannot live by bread alone by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Look, we must reorient our thinking from what the culture has imposed on us to what the Word of God says. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? Amen.